delighted to be in your presence this morning. Thank you for welcoming us into this place. Thank you for seeing us when we needed a Savior the most, and at that very moment, sending your Son Jesus to die for us. Father, thank you for being in this place as we worship you today. Your Spirit can comfort every heart, can mend the brokenness, can set the captive free, can make new what is old, can restore what has been lost, and can renew your people. Oh God, may it be so in this time of worship. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. It is a joy to welcome each of you to the worship of God today with Nashville's First Baptist Church. We are so honored that you're here. It's just another typical Sunday at this congregation uh, in worship. We are delighted to have our very special guest, the Centrymen, who are singing with us today. And it is good to be able to stand out or, or to stand here and to see many of our choir members who are now today in the congregation. So just for their benefit, Choir members, we are glad that you're here today as well. <laughs> In all seriousness, Centrymen, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, this is not your first time to uh, be at this church and uh, during, during my pastorate. It's always a joy to welcome each of you. I consider some of you dear friends. Uh, Steve and I went to uh, Samford together, and his wife and my wife, uh, we're roommates at one time at Samford, so it's always good to see some, uh, some old friends and to have the opportunity for some reconnection. Let me say just a quick word about one or two other things. Our men that are here today are probably walking just a little bit straighter, a little bit taller than normal because they attended our men's retreat this weekend. Uh, General William Shelton here on the front row with Tom and Jackie was one of our guest speakers. We also were privileged to have uh, Matthew Esplanchade, who is uh, the director of the uh, FBI here in Tennessee. Uh, and both of these men did such an outstanding job leading us this week. Tom, you and your, your team, just a great job together. Uh, some of you smelt brisket when you came in the church today, uh, and it's because we grilled, uh, I don't know, 600 cows uh, for, for this event. Uh, Derek Rodriguez sitting right over here did just an incredible job with Stephen Hall. I, I don't see Stephen. He's somewhere over there. Great, great. You fed us well, and uh, we had a great time together in the Lord. Well, there are guests that are with us today who may not call First Baptist your home. You're here because maybe you have a connection with some of the centrymen. Uh, you have honored us by being here today. We want to take just a moment in our service and just give opportunity to greet one another. It's cold and flu season, so use your elbows or fist pumps, whatever is appropriate. Uh, but let's stand together and greet one another, please.
bless you. you. may be seated. It's a great joy, honor, and privilege to have the Centurion with us today in worship. I've been a member of this group since 1988. This next year, we will celebrate as an organization, as a ministry through music, 50 years. It was originated in 1969 as part of the Radio and Television Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. We have with us several charter members still singing with the group. Gentlemen, would you identify yourselves? Raise your hand. Amen. It's been a great thrill to travel literally around the world singing the praises of God with this group of men who are my brothers. Our accompanists are Joseph Juber and Cindy Fuller. We are privileged to have Joseph back with us in just a few weeks. Incidentally, on April 22nd, we're going to partner with Capitol Hill Baptist for a program entitled, Every Time I Feel the Spirit, A Night of Spirituals. Joseph and his lovely wife, Renee, will be here. It'll be a great time of fun and fellowship through great music of the faith called Spirituals. So you won't want to miss that. Put that on your calendar. Our group is under the direction of musical director and conductor, Dr. Charles Fuller. Could you please give a very warm First Baptist Nashville welcome to the Centurion.
covet your prayers this week as the century will be in this sanctuary recording a new CD which will be released for our 50th anniversary tour in Texas next summer. Let's continue this time of worship with sing worthy of worship and praise. Would you stand with me? Deserving of you. We have heard sung and we have sung too. The fact you are worthy of our worship. Our friend, our redeemer, our protector, our father, our creator, savior and sustainer. You are our source of strength. Father, one of the ways we worship you is by giving back to you. Sometimes it's a tithe, sometimes it's an offering, sometimes it's ourself. And at this moment of this part of worship, we give back to you. So that your strength can be felt by those who are needy next door and across the world. 
so the love of Jesus Christ can be taught here in this building and throughout the world. So Father, part of us giving back to you is reminding of how worthy you are. Father, today during this time of worship, we pray for Eileen Edwards and the death of her brother in England this week. We pray for Phil Johnson who continues to remain in the hospital and recovery, recovering and gaining strength. We pray for our men and women around the world who protect us through military efforts, through law enforcement maneuvers, that they would feel your safety and protection today. We pray for Alan Berry, who's on a mission trip in Myanmar. Father, as he serves, uh, give him peace, comfort, mercy, and safety. Father, you are worthy, and you are our love. We give back to you at this time. For your name we pray.
Fuller, thank you, and thank you, Centuryman. We are in the midst of a series of messages through the book of Nehemiah. I recognize that we have many guests who are with us today, and I hope that you'll be able to find some benefit in the study of God's Word uh, with us as we look at this text this morning in the sixth chapter of the book of Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah continues to have people uh, who, in the midst of the work God has called him to accomplish, are doing their very best to distract him. I don't know about you, but my guess is, uh, because most people fit into that category uh, somewhere where this would ring true, our lives are plagued by distractions. There are so many different kinds of distractions that come our way. According to at least one article that I read from Inc.com, the average American worker that has an 8 to a 12-hour shift is going to waste about two hours per day on the company clock because of work-related distractions, personal distractions that take place in the workplace. You carry your cell phone with you to work, so all of your personal business can follow you wherever you go. And when you go home at the end of the day, if you're like many, you bring your notebook or your laptop home or you already have your computer there. And so when you're home, you're not really home. You're busy at work. And when you're at work, you're not always really at work because you've got your distractions there. The problem with distractions is that distractions take us further than we ever imagined they would take us. And that's really all I need to say this week as the pastor of First Baptist Church in Nashville about events in our headlines, isn't it? Distractions take us further than we would have ever imagined they would. So we look at Nehemiah chapter 6 this morning and we find the story of the attempted distractions that Nehemiah dealt with. And for our time this morning, what I want to do is simply read the first four verses. I'll share a comment. I'll read verses 5 through 9 and share something else. And then we'll close with verses 10 through 19 rather than read the entire chapter and go back through it. But I would encourage you in your personal study to let this Word of God soak in you. So read it. Read it slowly. Go home and take your text and, and read this carefully. Now, when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come and let us meet together at Hakafarim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them, saying, I'm doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. So the first observation, the first thing that I would encourage you to take note of from this text is simply to beware of the smiling distractions. And the smile is an important word there. There is a smiling distraction in this text because four times, it's, it's like Tobiah recognizes, you know, I have not been able to slow him down yet. I will, I will now employ a different method of attack and, and I'll try to become his friend. And so four times he sends a letter which would have been appropriate and, and says, why don't you come down from the busy work that you're doing and, and let's go out and, and let's meet. Now, I, I find it absolutely amazing how the Word of God gives us a, a, an opportunity to have just a little chuckle because where do they want to meet him? 
the plane of, oh, you can do much better than that. This is the plane of oh no, okay? That's where they're wanting to go. So where are they meeting? Oh no, that, that's how we would want to say that. And, and I'll test you on that maybe a little bit later, okay? So we go into this story recognizing here is a smiling distraction and there are probably many of those that you and I encounter throughout life. Sometimes people come to us all smiles, and they really wish to do us harm. And that's going to be the case. Nehemiah knows this. Nehemiah's prayer life is so strong that he was able to recognize this. Uh, maybe it was a spiritual insight that God gave him, but Nehemiah recognizes this. And, and when, the, when the temptation comes to, to give in to the smiling invitation, the distraction, Nehemiah says, oh no not going to do this, okay? So when you and I encounter the distractions in life that would threaten to either undo us, to take us off of something that is a vitally important task, a main issue in life, we need to be like Nehemiah and say, oh no, I'm not coming down to meet with you. Distractions come in many different forms, don't they? You and I may find ourselves uh, so busy, uh, so distracted with the day-to-day -day events in life that, that we have allowed ourselves to become encumbered with that all of a sudden we don't have time for a daily Bible reading or for a little bit of prayer time. One of the lessons that we are learning over and over and over again in Nehemiah is he was a man of prayer. When there was a distraction, when there was a threat, when there was uh, you know, a plot against him, the first thing that Nehemiah does is he prays. He doesn't wait for it to be his last resort. He says, God, I need your help. Sometimes those prayers are sentence-whispering kind of prayers, and other times those prayers are in great detail, as we see Nehemiah with an imprecatory prayer at one point. But Nehemiah goes, and he goes to God, and, and, and when the distractions threaten to dissuade him or to distract him, Nehemiah turns right around and gets involved in prayer and says to God, uh, I, I, I've got important work that you asked me to do. Then he turns to those distractions and he says, I've got important things to do to you too. Look at verses 5 through 9. In the same way, Sanballat for the fifth time sent his servants to me with an open letter in his hand. And it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel and that is why you're building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There's a king in Judah. And now the king will hear these reports. So come down, come and, and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him saying, no such things as you say have been done for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. There's a prayer at the very end of that. Now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. That's, that's the kind of prayer life that Nehemiah was able to practice because Nehemiah had bent his knees for longer periods of time. He knew that God recognized his voice in a crisis, and so when Nehemiah needed to, he could simply say, God, you've got this, don't you? The whole world is in your hands. I'm not worried about this. Here's the second main point here as we look at verses 5 through 9. You and I, when we're busy about doing God's work, would anticipate that there are going to be false accusations made against us. Just anticipate it. It doesn't always happen when the, 
distractions hit or when the uh, enemy attacks or when there's an antagonist that is grinding the life out of you or, or when the work that you're doing is, is suddenly beating up against a wall and you can't seem to make it uh, you know, any step further, remember that one of the tools, one of the, one of the strategies that the enemy is going to use against you and me will be that of a false accusation. I mean, it happens. You've been in ministry long enough yourselves to recognize that in the, in the trying times of life, there oftentimes will be somebody out there who, who gets wind of something, and then they get with somebody else, don't they? And, and they begin to talk about it a little bit more, and, and soon it's a whole class, or it's a whole committee, or, or it could be you know, half the board, and, and, and they're going to come at you with, with accusations that you know are totally false. Here's, here's the accusation here. Nehemiah wants to be king. Well, he had never said that. There was no sense in, in his experience that God had called him to be a king. And so as, as Sanballat begins to try to stir up trouble here at the last minute, he goes with a false accusation. They couldn't get him any other way. So here, let me tell you what you got to do. So, so come down from the wall. Let's go have counsel together. Let's talk about this because here's what they are saying. You ever heard that? Pastor, here's what they're saying. A good friend, here's what they're saying. In a Sunday school class, well, here's what, here's what they're saying. And sometimes, if we could just really get our hands on they, <laughs> well, usually they don't even exist. It's somebody, and they're right here, and, and all of a sudden, that's all you're hearing, and that's all you're seeing. Nehemiah responds in the same way to Sanballat. I don't have time for this. I'm not coming down off the wall. I'm doing an important work here. And God knows, and my character is strong enough, Nehemiah says, my character is strong enough, my reputation has been, ha has been forged, and, and you see my life, and others are going to see my life. And you know what? You just go ahead with they, and you tell that story, and let's see if it holds up down the road. Let's quickly get to the third section of this chapter. It begins in verse 10. It goes to the end of the chapter. Now, when I went to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mahatabel, who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God, within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. Let me pause there for just a moment. So the temple... Uh, for the priest, uh, it was okay for them to go in, but Nehemiah is not a priest. Nehemiah is not supposed to go to the inner parts of the temple, and that's probably what is being spoken of here. Let's go to the inner sanctum and let's close the doors where we can have this conversation and nobody else is going to hear us. You can maybe even have the idea of taking sanctuary there and Nehemiah looks at it and he says, you know, either way I do this, it's wrong. I'll either be running from the threat or I'll be going where I don't need to go. God has said, don't go. That's why it says in here, if I go in there, I might die. So picking up verse 12, and I understood and I saw that God had not sent him. But he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin, and so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. 
Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess, Nobadiah, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. So fear is this, is, is this terrible enemy that comes to us. When we're doing a good work of God, sometimes there are distractions, sometimes there are false accusations, but oftentimes there is the fear of the what-ifs. My friend, don't let fear grip you. Nehemiah understands this, and God reveals it to him, and, and Nehemiah remembers his character, and he says, wait a minute, I'm not going to run from this. I stand and fight. He doesn't say it in those words, but I'm reading in between the lines, and I think as a leader, that's what he's saying. Well, what good is it going to do me to run? What kind of leader would I be if I, if I took an easy way out, if I took an escape route, if I found an off-ramp? What kind of leader would I be in the midst of this kind of difficulty? I'm not going to do it. I stand here and fight. Nehemiah draws a line in the sand. I think it's a significant one, don't you? And look at verse 15 says, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. That's remarkable. From the first time that Nehemiah hears about the condition of the wall, probably four months goes by before he says to the king, I'd like to go and do something about this. The journey itself took at least two months to get there. He had to get the lumber, the timber, all the building materials, put together the right workers, make the assignments as to where they were going to go. But 52 days from the time he started his work, why this work could have only been done as God's hand was on Nehemiah and the people of God. And when all of our enemies heard it, verse 16 says, when all of our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and they fell greatly in their own esteem for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah and Tobiah's letters came to them and from many in Judah, they were bound by oath to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Era, and his son Jehohahan, and the daughters of Meshulah, the son of uh, Berechiah, as his wife. Also they spoke of his good deeds in my presence, and they reported my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. So distractions will get every one of us if we let them. False accusations may undo you if you'll let them. Fear will grip you and hold you if you'll let it. And so we look at this and we see great lessons for Nehemiah. We see great lessons for us. But there's one more extremely important word in this text. And it's the gospel that is found today in the sixth chapter of Nehemiah. You've heard me say this. I believe it with all my heart. You can turn every page in God's word and, and you're going to see the gospel. It's there. It's dripping with salvation's message. It's a message of hope from Genesis all the way through Revelation. And in Nehemiah chapter 6, we see the gospel. Here's how it looks. There's an accuser. And lying is his native tongue. His name is Satan. And he will accuse you, he will distract you, he will offer things to you that, that, that you think you have to have, and in the end, there's only heartbreak and disaster. He will do his very best to bring fear into your life, the fear of what if, the fear of what not. We start so many of our, our, our discussions with, well, I'm afraid if we do this, so-and-so is going to happen. And, and, and every time that is said, the enemy just laughs. 
But in the midst of this, there is a champion, and his name is Jesus. And he is not afraid. And his life was spotless. There are no accusations that can stand against him. And he was not distracted. He set his face toward Jerusalem, and he made his way to a cross because he knew that the only way the wrath of God would be satisfied that separates you and me from a holy God was for him to die in our place on the cross. And Jesus did that. He was not distracted. He was victorious. My friend, today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Lord, as the great commander of the army of God who, uh, who has done everything needed to purchase and secure your salvation, then today he would come into your life if you would ask him. It's not anything that I said, and as beautiful as it was, it wasn't anything in the music. It was the Spirit of God calling your life, calling your name, saying, this is true, believe it. And today, if, if your heart has been stirred, know this. It was because the Holy Spirit has been at work in your life. And the distractions, the accusations, the fears, those just serve as things to climb over to understand that there is a Savior who longs to be Lord of your life if you would let Him. Your prayer might be something as simple as this. Dear God, I recognize that I've lived my life. I've lived it for myself. I've lived it with some fear. I've lived it with some limitation. I've, I've lived it with the, the sense of, of always wanting to engage, but never quite being there. God, today I recognize the mess I've made in my life, and I'm asking Jesus to come into my heart and save me. There may be believers who are in this room today, and the distractions in your life are not unlike that that we hear about when Mary and Martha had the visit of Jesus who came. And one sister comes out and says, Would you please tell her to come in here and help me cook dinner? Jesus says she's chosen the best. She's at the feet of the Master. And my friend, today, if God's Word is not something that you are engaging in daily, if your prayer life is, is, is somehow just a hit-and-miss experience, if, if you're not growing and understanding God's Word, then, then today, whatever it is, you're too busy. The distractions have already won. Oh, believer, slow down. Pause. Make time for that which is so vital in your life. We're going to sing an invitation hymn, and I'm going to be standing at this altar. Other ministers are going to join me as needed, and if there's a commitment or a decision that you sense God is asking you to make in your life today, then would you please come? If you're looking for a place to call your church home, if you'd like to trust Christ, as your Savior, if you need to rededicate your life, would you come as we stand and as we sing? Mm -hmm.
thank you again for joining us for this time of worship today. It's our hope and our prayer that this hour will be an encouragement to you in the week ahead. I'm going to be standing in the foyer. If you're a guest today, we'd love to meet you and greet you, especially if you're looking for a place to call your church home. We have uh, some information and a gift I'd like to give you personally, so don't rush away. We've got a great lunch downstairs, soup for Super Bowl Sunday. It's an opportunity for your gifts uh, through our, uh, our, our kitchen to be used to help feed hungry people in our city. So let me encourage you that way. Some information on the back of your bulletin about that this morning. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord give you his peace. And God's people said, Amen. Oh, I'll be with you too.